All right, so this is our do now answer. So if you guys remember, we were talking like vocab detective. So we're taking this list of examples and we're classifying them into one or two groups to figure out the mystery words. This is now the answer. So group one, we have the saturated salt water solution. We have ammonia dissolved into water and we have a closed water bottle that is half filled with water. I know all of these have water in their examples, but water is not the reason why they've been grouped together. This one over here has burning of a log in a fire, uh, mixing sodium hydroxide and copper sulfate together to make a sodium hydroxide precipitate uh, with sodium sulfate still being in solution. This is the precipitation test, if you guys remember from last year. And then burning hydrogen with oxygen to create a pop. That was what you guys did yesterday with the pop test. So these are not grouped together because of the burning because this guy here does not show any burning. That's a precipitation reaction. Any idea of why this is group one and that's group two? Evaporation. Okay. These reactions here are reversible. So this is going to be uh, reactions that are subject to equilibrium. Which is what the topic is for today's lesson. So if anyone looked at the learning intention, it was to understand the principles of equilibrium and how to disrupt it. And those are examples of reactions that will go to equilibrium. This one here is examples of non-reversible reactions. These ones do not have an equilibrium. They just go to completion. So reactions that go to completion. So those are the two groups. Cool. Um, I can put that onto Google Classroom if you guys want, just so you can have the summary of that. All right. Cool. Um, what I was going to say. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the Ed Puzzle first. Because um, I think, is it Hank Green or John Green? I think it's Hank Green. Uh, he does a really good job of explaining uh, equilibrium and disrupting equilibrium. And he has lots of animation um, animations to it. So let's watch that first. And then I can do some clarifications if you guys need any clarifications. And then I'll tie it back into ocean acidification. All right, let me just pause this. I'll turn back on this guy. Let's we'll see me again. There we go. All right. So, um, yeah, the answer to this one, we're looking at the forward reaction is the same as the reverse reaction. I have, like I said, the reactive products written on the board and just the arrows. So something to keep in mind when we reach equilibrium is that it, um, it very often is mistaken as the reaction stopping uh, because there is no observable change. So a lot of people assume that all reactions must go to completion because I don't see anything happening. But in reality, something is still happening. We just can't observe it because it's equal. Um, something else that is a common misconception is that the products and the reactants must be equal. That does not have to be the case. It can be... Um, it can reach equilibrium, but you might have a reaction where that equilibrium has a higher percentage of product than reactant. So don't let that be a common miscon um, don't let that misconception trick you up. Okay. Um, what else did I have to say about that? I think that was it. I'm trying to remember. I think that's it. All right. So for this question, what reaction suggests it is a one-way reaction? It is all happening in the gas phase. It has a single forward arrow. It is balanced. It is a synthesis reaction. So synthesis reaction we'll learn in thermochemistry. Um, it basically means you take the elements and you form a product. So which one is it? One, two, or three, or four? It is two. So you should always have a balanced equation regardless because we're not creating or destroying matter. But this equation here only shows a forward arrow. So everything that you guys have been doing up to this point in chemistry, we've only had forward arrows. In reality, a lot of the reactions that we are actually doing do have a reverse arrow as well. So be mindful when you guys are reading, um, and in particular with ocean acidification, you will stop start seeing the double-sided arrow or you see those the arrow that I was drawing because I like that one. I think it looks aesthetically better. So why does the rate of the forward reaction slow down as the reaction reaches equilibrium? So the temperature drops, the uh, product molecules start to degrade into the reactants, or there are fewer reactant molecules to react or interact. One, two, or three. Three. So the forward reaction, so when we talk about forward reaction, we are talking about the hydrogen and the uh, nitrogen reacting together to make ammonia. And so we are starting to run out of it. Now, the reason why we run out of it is because it's being used up. 
There's fewer molecules to interact, so that's why it's slowing down. Uh, think about the rate of reaction stuff that you might have done in year 11. So with rate of reaction, there's multiple things that can influence the speed of a chemical reaction that's occurring. The first one is concentration, so how many particles that are there. So the higher the concentration, the faster the reaction goes. And that's because you have more particles there that can collide. In order for a reaction to occur, you need, I should backtrack, um, you need to make sure that your reactants collide. They need to collide with enough energy, and they need to collide in the right orientation so that way they can react together and do something. So if it doesn't meet one of those three requirements, it's not going to have a chemical reaction. So one way we change chemical reactions and increase the rate is by increasing the concentration because then we have more particles. The second thing we can do is we can increase temperature. Uh, so think about it, it's a lot easier to dissolve sugar in hot water than cold water. And that is because the molecules, or I should say molecules, the particles are moving faster. And since they're moving faster, they're more likely to hit each other and they're more likely to have energy, enough energy to do that reaction. So the heat energy is going to be able to be used in a chemical reaction. So that's option two. Option three is, now my brain, got to remember, surface area. If you chop up your sugar, instead of having a sugar cube, it has more exposure, and thus more exposure, more likely to collide. Uh, and then the last one is enzymes. Enzymes are little matchmakers. They provide a meeting place for these two substances to meet and do their chemical reaction. So those are all things that cause a chemical reaction to occur. So in this case, as we are using up the hydrogen and the nitrogen, you're going to then have less of the reactants to react together with each other. So that's why it slows down. So what does not happen at equilibrium? The rate of the forward reaction and reverse reaction are equal. The concentration of all species in the reaction remains the same or the reaction stops. So one, two, or three. Does the reaction stop? Or sorry, what does not happen? So the reaction does not stop, and then are the concentration of all species remain constant? So they would. Yeah. Should be the first one. Oh, sorry, third one. All right, so uh, a change in the shift of the reaction to the right would mean what uh, substance is now being made more of, the reactants or the products? Or two, two products. So this is shifting it to the right. This is shifting it to the left. All right, so um, the first, so when we talk about disrupting equilibrium, there's multiple ways we can do it. The first example that he's talking about is if we change the concentration, and we can change the concentration of any substance in the reaction. Now, the thing to keep in mind whenever we're talking about disrupting equilibrium is that the the direction that the equation is going to go um, is going to basically undo the change that was made to restore the balance. So uh, in this example, they said adding more hydrogen, so adding more of this would shift the reaction into what direction? Will it shift it, shift it to the right or to the left or upside down, which is, I think, pretty obvious. It's not upside down. So if I increase the concentration of this, which direction will it go in? The right. So it's going to go to the right because we've added extra hydrogen, and so it wants to use that hydrogen up to reestablish the balance. So thus, it forced the reaction going forward to the right. So I'm very mindful that that might have been a little bit confusing because now we're talking about um, pressure, which is another aspect. So first thing that he mentioned was... With this harbor process, we want to make ammonia because ammonia fixes nitrogen that's in the air into a form that plants can use. So nitrogen is very essential to life. Um, now, we know this reaction goes to equilibrium, and we don't want it to go to equilibrium because if it did, we're not going to make as much ammonia as possible. So one of the ways that we can interact with these equations that do go to equilibrium and are reversible is that we can uh, do things to it to force it in a certain direction. So one of the ways to force it in the forward direction to make ammonia is that we, we, we remove the ammonia as it's being produced. And if we remove the ammonia as it's being produced, the ammonia concentration still stays really low. And because this is low, it's gonna keep forcing it forward. So that was the first kind of step of what we were doing. Are we okay with that idea? So it's just playing with the concentrations again. All right, second one we are talking about then is going to be about pressure. So these two here, we add it, that's one and three, so that's four moles of 
molecules in that side and then only two on this side. So in the Harbour process, we increase the pressure, so we push the vessel down so it's smaller and smaller. And when we do that, we want to go to the side that has the fewer moles of gas, so that way it doesn't take, it's not as dense. So if I did that, am I going to the right? Um, to get more moles of gas? Am I going to the left to get more moles of gas? Am I going to the right to get less moles of gas? Or am I going to the left to get fewer moles of gas? So we see am I going right or left? I'm going to the right. And then if I go to the right, am I getting more or less? Less. So that's why it's doing that. Sorry. Okay. So... Uh, this is the equation here with water. So we have H2O as a liquid. When we want to get it from a liquid to a gas, we need to add heat to force it forward. So just a nice little recap from structure and bonding. If you require heat, are you endothermic or exothermic? Endothermic. So, yeah. So remember, when we feel things that are cold, things don't actually feel cold. My can of Coke doesn't feel cold. The reason why it is, or it's not like emitting cold particles, what it's doing is it's taking the heat away from my hand, and that process is why it feels cold. So keep that in mind. Um, so that forward reaction is going to be endothermic, and then the reverse reaction, if I want to get something from a gas to a liquid, I need to take, oh, it's going to release heat in that process. So that is going to be exothermic. So you're always going to have one of each whenever you're dealing with stuff. All right, so if the temperature is increased, so heat is being added, which direction will we go? Will we go to the left or the right? Which one was endo? <laughs> the forward one. Forward was endo, reverse was exo. Because if you look at this as an equation, this is adding heat to the reaction, so the forward is endothermic. If we go in reverse, that is releasing heat, so that's exothermic. So if I add heat, I need to use it up. So think about heat like it's a, uh, like a resource in the equation. So if I increase heat, I need to use it just like you would. With, so I would need to go to the uh, right. Right? Left. I'm looking at it wrong. Direction's that. Right. <laughs> I'm just trying to think. My <laughs> brain was reading this. Enough. Does that make sense? This is probably the trickiest one to understand. So you see how heat is on this side of the equation? What it's trying to communicate across is that the heat is being used by the water to break the, the intermolecular forces, the hydrogen bonds between the mo water molecules. That is an endothermic process. So going forward is endothermic. I have to absorb heat to break the bonds. When I go in reverse, I am making new bonds. And when we make bonds, it releases heat energy. That's exothermic. It's very counterintuitive when it comes to things like water, because you think about if I put a pot of water onto the stove to boil it, you're like, oh, this is, must be exothermic because this is a hot pot of water. But you have to remember, no, the water is absorbing that heat energy. So even though the pot is hot and the water is hot, it's absorbing the heat energy to become hot. So that is endothermic. Whereas when I pour the water into an ice tray and I put it in the freezer... You think, oh, it's going in the freezer, it must be cold. It's going into the freezer because the freezer will absorb the heat energy that needs to be released in order to make those bonds. That's exothermic. So the water's releasing heat energy to do that. Okay? <laughs> See, some people are like, I don't know. It's okay, we'll go over it some more later. Cool. All right, so we're looking at this equation here, I think. Yes, I am. Okay, so... That one was a nice color change one because when you alter either concentrations, you can see it because one's pink, one's blue. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. I don't actually have the equation here. Um, but the question here is if I change the pressure inside the test tube, what direction will the reaction shift? Will there be no change because the reaction does not involve gases? Will it go to the left side because there's fewer moles of particles or will it go to the right side because there are more moles of particles? It's a little trickier because you don't have the equation. I think it would have been nice if I gave you the equation. One, two, or three. Three. Does pressure apply to things that are not gases? No. So, so they're both, they're all liquids. It's like aqueous and liquid are the two states. So there would be no change in this case. So pressure doesn't have any influence. So be mindful, pressure only applies when we are talking about reactions that have gases. If it doesn't have a gas, 
Don't have to worry about it. Okay? Cool. All righty. Just move that down and get that there. And get... <laughs> Should I get the regular ones? Do you guys want the cheesy ones next? Or you just don't want, don't want to bother? No cheese. Just spicy. Oh. Okay. Don't bother with that cheese nonsense, man. What about the cheese puffies? Do you guys want to try the cheese puffies? Okay, I'll get the cheese puffies. Okay. Cool. All right, team. So, I want to tie back what we just saw with equilibrium. Uh, to the ocean acidification, because that whole equation, the whole thing has the double-sided arrows. So they have multiple steps of reversible reactions. So when we talk about uh, ocean acidification, the first step... <laughs> people are just chucking down the numbers. <laughs> it's, it's a really it's hard thing. Do like It tastes good, but it's spicy. Anyway, so... First step when we're talking about equilibrium, or sorry, when we're talking about ocean acidification is that we have carbon dioxide, which is a gas. All right, that's in our atmosphere. We then add water, which is our ocean, and that's going to dissolve. So it's going to dissolve like you have in bubbly drinks. And you guys saw that last term when I used the soda stream and I, I forced carbon dioxide into the water. Now we know when I did that, that the, car the water became acidic because we saw that with the pH indicator. It's kind of crazy to see that. Um, what did I want to add about that? Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. That's the same reason. Do you guys notice when you leave a cup of water out on your nightstand and you wake up the next morning, you take a drink and it tastes like weird? It's because the carbon dioxide has dissolved into the water. So the water is now slightly acidic. So that's why you leave a cup, glass of water. It tastes funny. All right. So when it does that, it makes carbonic acid. And now my brain needs to work and figure out what carbonic acid is. So let me just look up that equation because my brain's not working today. Make sure I get the equations right for you. Yeah, it's a long session, you guys. My brain's not working either. There we go. There we go. Okay. H2CO3 is what we're looking at for our equation. So that there is the carbonic acid. We go with that? So that is the uh, carbon dioxide, oh, sorry, the carbonic acid. That is what you're tasting when you have that old water. Okay. Um, so basically what has happened here is these two things have uh, combined together. You have your carbon here, your carbon here, one or two oxygens plus that one, that's the three, and then your two hydrogens coming over there, not creating or destroying matter. All right, now the next thing to keep in mind when we're looking at these equations is that in order for something to be an acid, it needs to disassociate and release the hydrogen ions. That is what this does when it's in that water. So you get the first step, which releases one hydrogen, and you get uh, bicarbonate, salt aqueous. And again, since everything here is aqueous or liquid, the only thing here that is a gas is that, so we don't have to worry about pressure when we're talking about ocean acidification. So pressure does not change how this reaction is going to behave. On top of that, you can't change the pressure of like our planet. We can't suddenly make it more pressured. So that's the other thing. All right, so that's the ste second step. And then the last step, I don't know if I should, yeah, I'll draw it over here, is you release a second hydrogen ion and, oops, drop three, you then have your leftover carbonate. So that's the whole ocean acidification equation. You zoom out so you guys can see the whole thing. Are we good with that so far? Okay. Um, what else did I want to add about that? I'm just going to leave it. I'm going to leave it here for now. I'm going to go back to the image. So the thing about what has happened with um, ocean acidification in relation to carbon dioxide, it's recording so you can watch the rest of it. All right. So what has happened is when we think about the carbon cycle, 
which is why I included this image again. The carbon cycle has a very delicate balance of where carbon is in our Earth. So we remember, we cannot create or destroy matter. So the carbon that's in our atmosphere as carbon dioxide existed on our planet already. So the amount of carbon is not the issue. It's where we are finding the carbon that is the issue. So for you know billions and billions of years, we've had no issue because most of our carbon was locked away in things like fossil fuels. So it's a solid state, doesn't cause us any issues. The moment we start burning them though, we have now changed it. We've done a chemical reaction and now the carbon dioxide, sorry, the carbon that was in our fuels like methane is now being uh, transferred and reacted to carbon dioxide in our air. All right. Now, again, this used to have a, there used to be a natural balance to everything. What used to happen is we would only get carbon dioxide coming from things like volcanoes and volcanic eruption. But the moment we did the industrial revolution, and we started burning it. We have now increased the carbon dioxide. So if we go back to our equation here, what has happened is when we think about disrupting equilibrium, we have increased the CO2. And that has caused a chain reaction. The chain reaction now is that we're forcing things to go forward in this reaction. And it's causing the cascade downward. Are you okay with that so far as our initial idea? So that is why when we have to worry about climate change and all the burning of uh, carbon dioxide and carbon credits and things like that, it's related to the ocean. This we did not pick up right away because the ocean has a buffer system. So I very briefly talked about it yesterday. I'll go over it again because I could see that some people didn't quite get it and that's fine. So whenever we're talking about uh, reactions, I'm just trying to grab some more colors that I like. Okay, so whenever we're talking about reactions, we talk about things as being proton donors or proton acceptors. If it donates a proton, that is an asset. If it accepts the proton, it is a base, okay? When we're looking at one side of the equation, um, we call that just acid and base as the labels. When we talk about the other side of the equation, we call them the conjugate. So the conjugate acid, the conjugate base. When we are talking about a buffer, a buffer has a mixture of either an acid and its conjugate base or a base with its conjugate acid. Let me give you the example in regards to the ocean acidification. So in the ocean acidification, we have a buffer. Buffers are there to prevent change in pH. So pH changes when you increase the hydrogen ion concentration or you decrease it. Are we okay with that? Do you want me to write that down? We good? Okay. So if I have a high hydrogen concentration, I have something that is acidic. If I have a low hydrogen concentration, I have something that is basic. So luckily for a very long time, we had no issues with our oceans changing pH. It was very, very stable. And that was because of something called a buffer. So in this buffer pair, we had the bicarbonate, also known as hydrogen carbonate. So HCO3 minus, and we also had the carbonate, CO3 two minus. These two things are both present in our ocean and they were responsible for maintaining the pH of the ocean so it doesn't change. This here, is our acid component. And the reason why that guy there is the acid component is because it will give off the hydrogen ion. Now the conjugate base is on the other side and that is going to be what accepts the hydrogen. So that's the carbonate. So since we have that pair there, that acts together as the buffer. So what used to happen when we didn't disrupt the equation, like we did, is that say for example, the ocean became more acidic. So there's lots of hydrogen ions. What it would do is it would react with the carbonate and force the reaction to go backwards. So it would neutralize the hydrogen ions so that way the pH remained the same. If, for example, the ocean became more basic and it had uh, a few hydrogen ions, and this was a low concentration, it would force the reaction to go forward to make more hydrogen ions and reestablish the balance for the ocean so that way it, had the, it maintained its pH. Are we okay with that so far? So it's a very delicate balance that has happened. The problem is we have way, way, way too much of this hydrogen ion. 
So we're really forcing this reaction to use up the carbonate. And in fact, our carbonate is not keeping up anymore. So we are running out of carbonate to neutralize the base. So buffers are not perfect. They are not infinite. The moment we use up one half of the buffer, we then have pH changing. So since we are using up the carbonates, the pH is now starting to change in the ocean. Are we okay with that so far? All right. Um, what else did I have to add about that? I'm trying to remember. Okay. So part of the th reason that we did not realize that this was going to be as big of an issue is that we thought the ocean will be able to manage whatever we throw at it. We thought this is a really good buffer system, and regardless of how much we put in, it's going to be okay. It'll neutralize. The reason why we thought that was because we thought with um, things like shells and rocks and things like that, there would be weathering, and that weathering would um, cause the breakdown to release more carbonate into our ocean. So we thought that it was just going to replenish itself. That did not happen. We are now running out of carbonates. All right, so we're running out of carbonate. We're no longer able to neutralize it. The acid, the, the ocean becomes more acidic. The other thing that is going to be an issue with ocean acidification is that this carbonate here is needed for our shells. So one of the big things in our ocean is that we have calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is a solid. It is not soluble. So this is what we make shells out of. So all the sea creatures that have a shell component or like the coral, it needs calcium carbonate in order to form their shells. However, this is now becoming less and less present and so they are not able to build their shells. The other issue is that hydrogen has a greater affinity to carbonate than the calcium. So if carbonate has to choose, do I wanna go with hydrogen or if I wanna go with calcium, it's gonna go with the hydrogen. It's more attracted to that. Oh, oh my goodness, thank you. There, I'm sorry. So it is more attracted to hydrogen than it is the calcium. So if you're thinking about competition-wise, th this is gonna form before that's gonna form, which again means that basically the shells in our ocean are dissolving, which is really bad for our sea creatures. So in tomorrow's lesson, I will talk about what that means, but not tomorrow, Friday's lesson, I'll talk about what that means in the bigger scheme of the ecosystem. Okay? Questions, concerns, comments? All right, I just wanna kind of, cause I know we got a weird amount of time left. Um, I just wanna show you guys the assessment criteria that I was talking about. So um, be mindful that I am covering things based off of the uh, ocean acidification chemistry checklist. So one of the things you need to do for merit is talk about the carbon cycle and how that links into this whole story. Uh, the other thing you need to talk about for merit are buffers. And then the last thing here, oh, I didn't talk about this one. Good, I have something to keep up. <laughs> All right, sorry guys, I lied, I'm not done. Okay, so, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, so, something to keep in mind is endothermic and exothermic. This is gonna be really important for the excellence because it's gonna talk about the complexity of ocean acidification. So, this forward reaction Carbon dioxide dissolving into water, that releases heat, so that is an exothermic reaction. Okay? Are we okay with that so far? So the reverse reaction is endothermic, and that's going to absorb heat. Now, here's the tricky thing about ocean acidification. The temperature of our planet is going up, right? So it's actually a good temperature of the earth is going up in reference to ocean acidification because if the temperature of the earth goes up, less carbon dioxide would dissolve in the water, making carbonic acid. So it's a weird kind of double-edged sword. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're writing up for that excellence level is talking about how this is a very complicated system. So global warming actually slows down ocean acidification. And in fact, it is a positive feedback loop. So what that means is... So global warming slows ocean acidification 
Reason being the forward reaction of endothermic. So if the global warming adds heat, we're going to do the endothermic reaction and prevent and use up that heat. Um, global warming slows ocean acidification. Uh, it creates a positive feedback loop. So as the earth gets warmer and warmer, less and less carbon dioxide gets to dissolve into the water. And since less and less carbon dioxide gets absorbed into the water, the carbon dioxide stays in the air, continuously heating up the planet. So that's what I'm saying. It's a positive feedback loop. All right, now that's everything. Uh, focus is to work on that just the achieved document. I want it done ideally by the end of the week so you guys can know that you have those seven credits in the bag and then next week we'll start on or we'll pick back up organic next week.